The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on facebook.com forward slash Arab News. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Ray Hanania here at the uh, Ray Hanania radio show sponsored by Arab News newspaper and the U.S. Arab Radio Network. It's Wednesday, September 1, 2021, 8 a.m. Eastern time. We have a great lineup of invited guests and topics this morning. Um, segment one, I actually pre-taped this with Minnesota Congresswoman Betty McCollum. She's the chairwoman woman of the House Defense Appropriation Subcommittee and a leading champion of human rights who's spoken out and introduced legislation to defend civilians around the world, including in Palestine, which sometimes is tough for uh, members of the U.S. Congress to do. They'll defend everybody and criticize everybody, but not when it comes to Israel and Palestine. We're going to uh, broadcast her pre-taped interview right after our first break in a minute. In April, uh, Congresswoman McCollum called for the protection of Palestinian children and families living under Israel's military control. And uh, last year, she introduced a bill that would prevent America from recognizing the West Bank as a part of Israel annexation if Israel annexed the military occupied territories. McCullen comes from the American heartland, heartland and is a strong critic of Israeli human rights abuses against the Palestinians. And I was very excited to get her on uh, the radio show. She's very smart. And I think you're going to be interested. She also talks and we talk a lot about Afghanistan, what happened there. Now, remember, this interview was taped uh, the day everything started to collapse in uh, Afghanistan the same day morning when uh, the uh, ISIS-K um, struck with two suicide terror bombs uh, and killed 13 Americans. So this interview is a little early based on what we know about that today. Uh, we know so much more, but at the time it had just happened. So uh, I'll remind everybody about that. Later on in segment two, we're going to uh, talk about the withdrawal of American forces from Afghanistan, the rise of the Taliban and the Biden administration with conservative Arab news columnist and op-ed writer Dahlia al Akidi. Dahlia has joined the program many times before um, and uh, always offers a great, interesting perspective on what's happening. It just seems that, uh, you know, I think that it, what's really interesting about this whole Afghanistan Taliban debate uh, here in the United States is that America is still so polarized. There's no middle ground. You can't like support one side, the Biden side and support the other side, the Trump side. It's either all or nothing. You know, I'm right in the middle. I'm looking at both and I'm, I criticize both. I praise both. I point out the good, the bad, you know, and the ugly because that's the way it should be. But we've gotten away from that. We got this big gap. It's like a, uh, I don't know, a just deep gorge. Uh, it's so deep and the two sides are far apart. If you say anything on the, the Trump side um, that they don't like, doesn't matter that you could agree with them on stuff. They're going to go crazy. I, I'm on a uh, uh, Facebook uh, like uh, social media called iDobinet and also Gab News and MeWe. I, in addition to Facebook, I, I have... Uh, a presence on all four of those. And I do in it's very conservative and I'm on there and they're yelling at me because one, I had Betty McCollum on my show <laughs> and I, I have to laugh at that. And the other thing, it's like they defend Trump to the death and they're so angry at Biden. And then on Facebook, I'm listening as everybody is criticizing me uh, because I'm defending some of what Biden is doing. You know, I criticize him. I defend him. That's my job as a columnist at Arab News. And by the way, you go to Arab News at ArabNews.com. 
uh, to get some really great insight. Now, I did invite members of the U.S. State Department. I've been inviting uh, uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and even the spokesperson Ned Price many times. Unfortunately, they have not agreed to come on. It's a big disappointment for me because uh, I think that the U.S. needs to appeal not just to the Arab world, more directly, and radio is a great way to do it here at the U.S. Arab Radio Network, the only radio network in the United States that focuses on Arab American and Middle East views. But I think they need to reach out to Arab Americans, don't they? They need to kind of talk to us, get us involved. Wouldn't it be helpful? Um, you know, we're American. I served during the Vietnam War, and that's the tragedy of Afghanistan. It's so similar uh, Today, each war was 20 years long, Vietnam uh, ending in 1975 and Afghanistan ending now, both 20 years, both kind of uh, embarrassing. Uh, it feels like we've been defeated by the Taliban, uh, just like we were defeated by the Viet Cong uh, when we ran out of there in 1975. And, you know, as a Vietnam era veteran, I was really kind of ashamed of that. Of course, my brother was a U.S. Marine. My father uh, was in the Fifth Army with the OSS. And my uncle Moses, they put him in the uh, Navy during World War II with my dad, was in the Fifth Army OSS during World War II. Um, very American. I mean, listen, Palestinian Americans, we're as American as everybody else. But they put Moses in the Navy. He wanted to go with my uh, dad, George, uh, to fight against the Nazis. And, the, you know, the Japanese the uh, back in after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, but instead of uh, putting Moses in the army with my dad, they loved his name. And they said, listen, we need Moses in the Navy to help part the seas. And literally, that's how he ended up on a battleship in the uh, North Atlantic during World War II for four years. I don't know. That's a tough one. Anyway, this is Ray Hanania here at WNZK AM 690 radio um, and in uh, greater Detroit and WDMV AM 700 radio in greater Washington, D.C. We're streamed live at Facebook.com slash Arab News. And if you have questions on the Facebook page uh, later on after we play this pre-tape, um, we'll take some. We'll see if we can answer some of those. So uh, go to the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash Arab News and uh, type up some of the questions. And I have uh, I got some great producers, uh, Jad and Max. Um, Max, I think, will monitor some of those questions and send them to me here while I'm doing all the Zoom with everybody. Um, and also, by the way, next week, uh, just to give you a preview of next week's show, Wednesday morning, we have Anissa Asabi George. She's an Arab American running in the race for mayor of Boston. Miss George is an American politician who serves as an at-large member of the Boston City Council, where she is the chair of both the Committee on Education and Homelessness, Mental Health and Recovery. So Miss George will join us next week talking about her election, uh, you know, her uh, role and the rise of Arab Americans in terms of getting involved in politics. Anyway, I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we will uh, play that interview here uh, with uh, Betty McCollum, which I know you're going to enjoy because Betty McCollum is such a sharp member of the U.S. Congress. And then later in segment two, we'll talk with Dahlia El Akidi. I'm Ray Hanania. We'll be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Life is a nonprofit charity that's provided humanitarian aid and development to people and communities for over 25 years, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. When disaster occurs here or around the world, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. Please help improve these efforts. Make your tax-deductible donation to Life now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. While we've been staying safe at home, scientists have been on a journey. The destination, a COVID-19 vaccine. 
This journey began decades ago with research into other coronaviruses. Scientists built from there with months of research and development, cooperation with other experts worldwide, and clinical trials on tens of thousands of volunteers of diverse race, age, and health status. They arrived at a safe, effective vaccine, and hundreds of thousands in Michigan have already been vaccinated. But the next step is ours. We need to get the vaccine when we can. Keep wearing masks correctly and taking precautions until we reach our destination, freedom from COVID-19 and getting back to the lives we love. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali al-Baghdadi and Fatty Bottom serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali al-Baghdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all seafood guidelines and is open every day 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant, 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on facebook.com forward slash Arab News. And welcome back to the Rayhan and Nia radio show here at Arab News and the U.S. Arab Radio Network, uh, broadcasting on WNZK AM 690 radio in Detroit and WDMV radio in Washington, D.C., uh, and also live on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arab News. This is the uh, interview I taped with uh, Betty McCollum. Uh, Michael, our producer back in Detroit, may uh, interrupt me if for some reason we don't hear anything. I want to, you know how technical these Zoom things are, but I'm pretty sure we got it right. So let's go ahead and broadcast this. All right, here we go. Thank and... you, Ray. All right. Uh... Now we have uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum from Minnesota's 4th District. She's the chairperson of the House Defense Appropriations Subcommittee working on, working on strengthening her district while also addressing issues of national security and defense appropriations. She's a fearless voice in speaking out against injustice nationally and internationally. And she often is uh, quoted uh, talking about issues of human rights in the Middle East, including in Palestine and Israel. Welcome to the program this morning, Congresswoman. Well, thank you. And thank you, Ray, for uh, introducing me to your audience. Oh, we're happy to see we got people in Detroit and Washington, D.C. who love you. Um, This morning, obviously, the big topic continues to be Afghanistan. um, And I know that there's some breaking news as we talk. What's the status with that? Do we know anything? Well, right now, um, the airport, the international airport that's been used to evacuate um, U.S. personnel, uh, NATO personnel, as well as uh, Afghans who uh, help uh, us in, in, in the fight against al-Qaeda, uh, are, there's been an attack at the airport. There's Afghan lives that are reported um, uh, lost from this earth, and uh, there are also uh, casualties now being reported of some of the U.S. Uh, citizens. I don't know if they were inside or outside of, of, of the fence yet. So, and, and I know obviously the main question that many people have is, did we pull out too quickly? Did we plan this right? Uh, do you have any feelings about what we can do to protect people? And at least if we're going to leave, do it in a way where our supporters in Afghanistan who helped us uh, are able to get out with our troops safely. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a history teacher. So I, 
we just have to take a second to reflect on the history um, when, and I, and I was present, I voted on September 14 uh, to go after Al Qaeda, which uh, you know, murdered uh, American citizens in, in New York, uh, caused uh, people to uh, uh, crash a plane uh, to, to save uh, more American citizens from, from being um, you know, victims of uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, after we accomplished that goal, the Bush, uh, you know, government decided it was going to nation build in Afghanistan and bit off more than it could chew with a very ambitious program. And since then, we have spent, uh, you know, close, close or more than $20 billion a year in Afghanistan. And we're not, we weren't seeing the Afghan government really being able to stand up and take, take grips. Uh, Kabul wasn't even safe the last time I was in there uh, several years ago. So the, the Trump administration decided, well, maybe it's time we see if we can figure out a way um, to, to pull out of Afghanistan because we're not seeing any, any meaningful progress. Maybe we can support the status quo. His failure was not including uh, the government of Af Afghanistan. Um, many of us spoke out about that. That's what President Biden inherited, but he also inherited uh, President Trump withdrawing out so many troops that we just had a hollow number left going into the Taliban fighting season. But what the uh, Afghani government uh, assured uh, President um, Biden was that they would, they would hold their own, that they would slow them down, that they would organize. And please, please do not uh, you know, uh, start uh, sending off alarm bells, uh, and what we lose, you know, our best and brightest to keep this country going, you'll show no faith in our government. And there was consensus that that this might fail, uh, this Afghan government might fail, but there was consensus that it might be six months to a year. Some people were saying two years, but at most of the intelligence meetings I went to, they said maybe six months, um, and that would give us time to do things. And as we saw, uh, the Afghani government fled its own people, and uh, with that, the military laid down its arms for the most part and just walked away. And, and so now we have people at the airport. And, and we, are, we are basically hostage for the Taliban to provide security outside that ring around the airport, are we not? Yeah, it's disturbing to a lot of people because for 20 years we've been taught that the Taliban were complicit with Al Qaeda in the beginning. Uh, they were our enemies. We fought with them. Um, and now to just see everybody walk out, you know, the way it's being done. And and I don't think anybody's I, I know there are people playing politics, blaming Biden, blaming Trump, doing all this stuff. But do you think when you look back at this, that maybe we made a mistake expanding this by going into Iraq in 2003, that maybe we should have held that off for many years so we could deal with Afghanistan and Al Qaeda and then come back to Saddam Hussein was definitely a bad guy. Nobody's saying he was good, but do you think that was a mistake? I mean, or is it not worth looking back at it at this point? It was a huge mistake. And that is uh, why many of us, not only did we believe that there weren't weapons of mass destruction, but we knew we would take our eye off of if we were going to try to uh, help the Afghan uh, uh, government, uh, the people of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a huge country uh, to come up with, whether it was a decentralized, uh, I thought it needed to be a decentralized form of, of government, much similar to what India had in its early days of democracy. Um, you know, but once we went into Iraq, you know, NATO forces were pulled there, we were pulled there. That that was that was the big, the big um, object that everybody ran to, and Afghanistan was just kind of you know put off to the corner. So a lot of the things that we could have done with working to listen to people about uh, people in these villages about what they wanted. Did they want wells dug for their water? Did, did they want a school? How did they want a school implemented? Um, did they want health care? They wanted all these things, but we should have gone in there like we do with our other foreign aid and talk to people and deliver what they want that they can build sustainability into it. And unfortunately, when the Bush administration for the eight years that they, they were in charge, they did not do that kind of developmental aid in Afghanistan and then um, was not focused on it because they got themselves involved in Iraq. Just a You're final, right. Sorry, just a final question about Afghanistan before we go into uh, Palestine and Israel. Is there anything that you think that needs to be done right now um, to just uh, at least, uh, you know, protect our, uh, 
withdrawing soldiers, our withdrawing uh, personnel, and even the Afghans who supported us to get them out of there. Well, is there anything that we could do to make it safer as we leave? So we'll find out who committed this atrocity against those people who were uh, at an airport seeking safety, seeking security for themselves and their families. Um, the intel that we were kind of uh, uh, hearing about the most is it was not the Taliban. It was either a rogue group uh, or it was ISIS-K, who the Taliban and uh, ISIS-K do not like each other. But what a, what a, you know, a showstopper for ISIS-K, right? Yeah. They, they could basically get two things done at once, attack the Taliban and attack the U.S. government and NATO at the same time. So we'll see who actually perpetrated this. But um, it, it's, we need to sit back and assess. Some in the Taliban have been helpful in securing safe passage and protecting the, those gates. And it was shared intelligence by not only us, but from what we were hearing from our, our, our allies, but also from the Taliban that they knew this attack was imminent. And that's why they were trying to uh, keep American citizens away, we were, and why the Taliban were telling people not to come to the airport. Some of it was their own selfishness of wanting to keep Afghanis there. Some of it was actually not wanting to have casualties and then being saying that they couldn't control K Kabul. So the, the Taliban seem to be a lot different today than what they were. And I think that's the big hope that everybody has, that it'll continue that's, that that's way. That's the hope. Uh, but as, uh, as uh, you know, I've heard from, from everyone, and I agree with this, we're not going to take them at their word. We're going to take them at their actions. And I'll make this bipartisan. To quote President uh, Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. I know, and uh, we switched gears just really quickly to the Palestine-Israel conflict. We have the new Prime Minister Naftali Bennett yes. uh, meeting with uh, President Biden this week, and uh, maybe today or tomorrow. And I'm wondering if uh, there's any message that you think should be driven home um, during that meeting that uh, Naftali Bennett should take back to Israel. You know, human rights are universal rights, and that includes Palestinians and uh, the rights of children need to be protected. Um, so I'm hoping that, uh, that the discussion focuses in on that, uh, laser focused on it, that the settlements, expansions have to stop, um, and uh, the rights of uh, Palestinians who uh, are Israeli citizens uh, not be given uh, second-class citizenship. There's a lot on the table, but I also am going to keep working on my bill to stop the detention of, of Palestinian children in military detention facilities, and that the billions of dollars of aid, we just give cash uh, actually to, to the country of Israel, that that have a receipt and an accounting for it so taxpayers' dollars know that. Not one dime's going for the destruction of homes and not one penny goes to imprison a child. And, and that, that's not a real popular thing. And of course, you've been criticized for all this, but I should point out that you've been also a big supporter of Israel uh, as a country and as, uh, you know, their security. And um, do you support the two-state solution and peace based on compromise? I support a two-state solution, but we need to get back to where that becomes a reality and not just a dream. And I'm, I'm watching that dream get smaller and smaller as, yeah. as people are you know, here at home and, and all over the world, and especially the Palestinians. So if we're going to talk about two-state solution, we have to be firm and honest about what that two-state solution needs to look like. And it's not the status quo for expansion of settlements. Has uh, the president's uh, administration been responsive to your concerns that you've expressed? Well, we were getting ready to have some deeper dialogue, and then this happened. So you know, our State Department is focused on getting, you know, U.S. Right. citizens out and, and Afghanis out. We had the terrible tragedy in Haiti. But let me say this. This is a tragedy what's happening in, Pal in the Palestinian area. And so we also need to focus on this. So I will not be silent about focusing on this. We're a large country. We're talented. Uh, we have uh, wealth and talent. We have wealth and treasure. And we can use it and spend it wisely um, to promote, um, you know, peace and stability, not only here at home with the, you know, injustices that we need, we still have to address here at home, but internationally as well. Any final thoughts at all before we just thank you for joining us this morning? Just my, my hearts are with 
the people in Afghanistan. Um, we put them at tremendous risk. Uh, and um, it will something that will, will haunt me forever, that I stay focused to work to uh, get as many Afghanis as we can, as we also get out uh, our allies. But this includes not just the interpreters, it includes the aid workers, it includes the, the women who were teaching schools that they feel that their lives, and then working with the international community to hold the Taliban accountable. They can't survive financially without the international community. We do have some leverage, but the international community needs to speak with one voice, and that is human rights. Human rights need to be protected. I know our audience is in Detroit and, and Washington, D.C., and even in the Gulf that's going to be watching this on Facebook are always encouraged by your comments. And we hope that you can join us again in the future. We love to have you on. Well, those countries in the Middle East, that are, they call them lily pads where people are transporting uh, through. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. Congresswoman Betty McCollum joining us this morning on the Ray Hanania Show on the U.S. Arab Radio Network and broadcast and sponsored by Arab News Newspaper at Facebook.com slash Arab News. Thank you so much. Peace. All right. Uh, that I can't believe the technology was so smooth. That was really good. Uh, so uh, it was nice of uh, Congresswoman Betty McCollum to join us to talk. I've reached out to so many members of Congress. I don't know why they're afraid of uh, speaking to the Arab American community. Uh, Menendez, such a strong voice. I reach out to him every week. I can't get a response from him. Um, and I've tried. I, you know, I've, I, I wish the State Department would uh, come on more. We did have one member of the State, State Department uh, join us, uh, but that was many months ago. And they need to talk to the Arab Americans. They need to talk to the Arab world. You know, they need to show that they care about us. And the one way they care about us is to talk to us through our media, not just in the Middle East, but here in the U.S. Arab News is the leading English language newspaper uh, in the Middle East, and, and we need to support them and read them. Um, and here in the U.S. as we expand, um, we need to augment that voice. Um, anyway, that was a great interview. I really appreciate Betty McCollum joining us this morning. We're going to take a break in a minute. Then uh, when we come back, we're going to be joined by Dalia Al-Akidi, who is a, a columnist with Arab News. And we're going to talk about the Biden administration, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, and this, and again, Member McCollum was looking at it the day the terror bombings took place in Kabul. Um, so it's been a week, obviously, since then. Um, but that was the only way we could uh, schedule that interview. Um, but Dolly will help us look back at what's happened over the past week, the terrible tragedy that's taken place and the response from our government. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to take a quick break here. And when we come back, we will have Dahlia Al-Akidi uh, with us uh, to talk about Afghanistan, the Taliban and other issues also. And of course, um, I'm trying to monitor Facebook. So if you have any questions, um, you can type them on Facebook and uh, Dolly and I will try to answer them. I'm Ray Hanania. We'll be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Bringing over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Ziad Brand. Quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rico Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. Imagine you're on a train track. Somewhere miles away, a train is headed your way. You can't see it yet, but it's coming. Slowly but surely. If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type 2 diabetes, you may be on the wrong track and diabetes could be heading your way. 
bit by bit. The danger is getting closer and closer. So should you stay on the track you're on now or move to make a change and reduce your risk? If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type 2 diabetes, you may qualify for the National Diabetes Prevention Program in your local community. This one-year program could be the ongoing support you need to put you on the right track. Not only did participants lose weight, they cut their risk of type 2 diabetes in half. Ready to get on board for a healthier future? Learn more about the National Diabetes Prevention Program and what else you can do to manage and prevent diabetes at michigan.gov slash diabetes. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on facebook.com forward slash Arab News. And welcome back to the Ray Hanania show here at WNZK AM 690 radio in greater Detroit and WDMV AM 700 radio in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're also uh, broadcasting live on the U.S. Arab Radio Network and also live streaming at facebook.com slash Arab News, where we got a lot of people are watching this broadcast. And I think it's you, Dahlia. I think, Dahlia, you're the magnet that has brought so many yeah, people yeah, yeah. to watch the show. <laughs> uh, we, had, you know, I'd hope to get uh, Ed Gabriel on, former ambassador, to give the Biden side. Um, but that's OK. He he wanted to be on. He, he wanted to come on. And you guys make a great pair when we're talking both sides. Um, but we're going to just kind of look at the uh, a little bit of the conservative side. Dolly has been a journalist for so many years. Um, she's a columnist with Arab News. You ran for political office once, uh, also in Minnesota. You worked as a news anchor, I remember, at El Hora TV. Um, right. And I, you're originally from uh, Iraq. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Where, where in Iraq? From Baghdad, and good morning to you and to your listeners and to whoever is watching us on Facebook. Good morning to you. Now, maybe let me start because you're Iraqi, and I know Saddam Hussein was not a good guy, okay? I, mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. But the question I've asked a number of people over the past was, was it smart to go into Iraq before we finished what we were doing in Afghanistan? Do you think that that tripped us up a little bit by diluting our forces? I don't think we ever paid real attention to Afghanistan the way we should have. Well, it depends who you're asking. Um, um, definitely. I mean, the way Saddam Hussein was ruling the country was, or the way Iraqis were living in Iraq was, was basically hell. Uh, Saddam was a brutal dictator and... Back then, I was one of the the Iraqi Americans that were that was that was cheering because that was the only way for Iraqis to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Right. Um. I I still think uh, the same after so many years. 
regardless of the outcome now. I mean, we right. cannot just blame Americans um, all the time. Oh, America did this or America did that. Um, Iraqis have responsibility as well. And the Iraqi opposition before, uh, during Saddam's era, um, painted a totally different picture than when they came to power. And, and if you look at through history, um, opposition leaders tend to paint totally different pictures um, than the reality. But if we look at Iraq now, it's on the right, it, it is on the right path at, at, at one point. Um, in Iraq, they have um, a constitution, they have some type of democracy, and they have elections and a year after year after year after year, I mean, 20, even 30 years in, in the history of, of countries, um, basically it's a short period of time. We feel it's a long time because we're witnessing it, we're witnessing every day um, of it. But in history, a hundred years from now, it would be that era that the Iraqis and, and uh, messed up and Americans in Iraq, but it was a good, um, um, it was a, a good step to get rid of uh, uh, of Saddam Hussein. But Afghanistan is a bit different. I mean, well, I, I was going to ask you before we go to Afghanistan. Yeah. So the bottom line is, I think when we look back at Iraq, um, it is slowly progressing. It it didn't turn out bad, correct? I, because that's it did. Be the... it, it did. Iraq is back now. Iraq is in the hands of pro Iranian uh, uh, pro Iranian militias. Uh, Iran is basically is uh, a war uh, zone? controlling is is controlling Iraq and controlling the political arena. And uh, it's in Iran's hand who gets to be what in Iraq. Well, isn't that, as... isn't isn't that what the concern is? I mean, when we look at Afghanistan. Before we look at it, we got to look back at Iraq then is that's where we put all our muscle. That's where we put the majority of our money. And exactly. we're still having trouble there then. Exactly. I remember uh, you mentioned that I'm, I'm a judge. I've been a journalist for a long time. And I remember prior to the invasion of Iraq, and prior to the war in Iraq, I've asked Throughout my interviews, I've asked um, several U.S. Uh, politicians and State Department officials, asking them what will happen if the new government would turn out to be pro-Iran. And I remember one of them I, uh, uh, told me, Dalia, do not jump into conclusion. This is good for the Iraqis. We, knew, we Iraqi Americans knew that. Um, but sometimes when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to America in, in general, they think of the future as tomorrow and the long term would be next month. Um, and uh, Iraq has paid the price for it. Yet, if they would want to do it again, definitely toppling Saddam Hussein was one of the best things that happened to Iraq because it's definitely. different. 20 years ago, 20 or 30 years ago, it's, it's so different. 20 years ago, um, the world didn't know what was happening in Iraq. We didn't have internet. We didn't have uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So uh, outside the borders of Iraq, no, even inside Iraq, you don't know what happens in, in, in your next um, neighborhood, in the next neighborhood. Nobody knew what was happening because it was all hush, hush, you can't hear anything. You're not allowed to see. You're not allowed to read anything but what the government feeds you, just like any uh, um, totalitarian uh, government. Therefore, we didn't know what was happening around the world. Everything is Saddam Hussein. If Saddam says this, it means this is, this is it. If you have a, a satellite dish, you go to jail. You No cell phones. You can't travel. So you're Basically, you're in a small jail called a country. Yeah, it was a terrible situation. I mean, oh. there's nobody I nobody I know thinks that it was wrong to go into Iraq. Definitely Saddam Hussein was a tyrant. The terrible things he did um, to the people of Iraq. The only concern I had was I think we bit off more than we could chew. 
I think we see that result in Afghanistan. It it looks I feel bad that we've kind of failed in Iraq, too. Now we've failed in Afghanistan, haven't we? And and why do you think we failed in Afghanistan? Well, because this is a big embarrassment, isn't it, for the United States? Totally, totally. totally. I mean, and this has nothing to do with me being a conservative or not. I mean, if right. you go outside in the street and ask, nobody said it's a, uh, let's keep our troops there. The majority of Americans are very happy that our troops are back and we don't want to be everywhere. Nobody, nobody's debating this at all. But the way it was executed, the humiliation that um, uh, our troops, our uh, our citizens, our uh, friends, and the people that worked and helped us for twenty years, our um, NATO allies—they're all we humiliated everybody um, under the pretext that we don't want to send more troops. But guess what? We did send more troops to get these troops out. Um, we made mistakes. We we gave up our um, uh, um, the only good and uh, exit for us, which is the Bagram Air Base. We gave we we left it. Even the commanders, uh, the Afghan commanders, did it. No, they came in the morning um, uh, and they saw an empty. Uh, Air raids. And, and I, I mean, think that and I think the Taliban probably have the best military equipment any country in the world could have at this moment. Correct. All that equipment. Exactly. Unbelievable. The Taliban is more equipped than all the pro Iran militias in Iraq and Hezbollah combined. Do you have any sense that, uh, you know, based on I mean, if we look back at the old Taliban and new Taliban, I guess it depends on whether you think there is a new Taliban. Um, there's this fear that all that equipment is going to end up in the hands of Hezbollah, uh, Iranian satellite, uh, you know, militias, the Houthis, the all over. I mean, um, it's just uh, a little disconcerting that we have this uncertainty about that. Definitely. I mean, um, f f oh, yes, the uh, Taliban is, is a bit different than 20 years ago. Now they speak English. Now they use cell phones and they take selfies. Um, and and actually, it's, it's ironic when I hear from the administration that the Taliban have vowed to fight terrorism. The question is, first of all, it's not Afghanistan, it's the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan. And uh, between, I mean, we have to highlight this. And for them, for the Taliban to vow to fight terrorism, what terrorism? Jihad in the Islamic Sharia is not terrorism. So what are we talking about? Let, let me let let me just interrupt and uh, make uh, read this uh, observation. We got so many people watching us on Facebook and we're going to take a break in a minute. And I want to come back and talk more about Afghanistan and the administration. But uh, Badri Kesto is uh, writes Iraq is not like Afghanistan. The situation in Iraq is fundamentally different from the situation in Afghanistan and cannot be compared to the situation of, in Afghanistan. Do you agree with that? I, I'm not sure because I am really concerned that there does seem to be a little more order in Iraq. Um, and it is the beginning of what may be the new Afghanistan. But no, no, I don't no. like the government in Iraq. I, I don't like the direction that Iraq is going. And I I'm worried like Afghanistan is going to go in that direction. No, too. But, no. but Badri, thank you so much for your uh, comment on Facebook. We appreciate it. Yeah. Go ahead, Dahlia. Sorry. Uh, um, I agree with with him 100%. Iraq is not Afghanistan at all. It's totally different. Even the people are, are, are very different. What we're seeing, I mean, what we're seeing in Iraq is not uh, uh, driven by religion. It's not like uh, yes, we uh, they believe in wilayat faqih and they believe uh, this is different. This is political Islamism. It's different. It's more driven by Iran than anybody else right now and for the past few years. So it's totally different. But in, in Afghanistan is, uh, I mean, pe people there, 
the past 20 years, it wasn't like heaven to, for the Afghan people, but it was step one to a new life. Um, I wouldn't say that in the past 20 years, it was... Uh, it was great for for the women of of, of Afghanistan. No, still the tribal um, mentality, still the religious mentality is much it's much different and and much stronger than uh, uh, than uh, the people in Iraq. So let's not compare them. Um, uh, but it but it is. I think the last 20 years, you're, you're right. I mean, I, I think that there were some good things in Afghanistan. We saw the oh, openness, yes. oh, the yes. openness. And it's I think everybody focuses on the openness. And I'm you know, I want to see the openness continue. But I'm a little concerned about the Taliban. Yeah, oh, I, I'm a little worried. Listen, uh, Dahlia Akiti is my guest. We, we have to take a quick break. Uh, Dahlia is a longtime veteran journalist. She writes for Arab News uh, every week. Um, and has some great columns and opinions. Uh, a conservative, if you don't mind me calling you that, obviously, correct? Yeah. Oh, definitely. I'm a proud and, conservative. And, it, and, it'll, and after the break, I want to talk to you about this uh, polarization in the U.S. where there's no middle ground, is there? It's either you're one side or the other. So we're exactly. going to talk with Dahlia more about Afghanistan and uh, maybe the political change and what we expect is going to happen there. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation this morning on the Ray Hanania radio show in Detroit, Washington, D.C., on the U.S. Arab Radio Network and also at Facebook.com slash Arab News. We'll be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Enjoy the first Syrian-style cuisine in Michigan. At Damas Cuisine and Catering, you'll find a wide selection of Syrian foods and sweets in our menu, like free cake, poise, grape leaves with steak, mashawi platter, hot mahashi, char-grilled kebab, shawarma, and much more. Get super-fast delivery from Damas Cuisine and Catering right to your door. Order online at damascuisine.com forward slash menu and track your order live. Damas Cuisine and Catering, 28841 Orchard Lake Road in Farmington Hills. Call 248-987-4985. When you're looking for the best in optical care, Dr. Imad Nakash is your doctor to see. With years of experience and thousands of successful procedures performed, you can trust your eyes to Dr. Imad Nakash. See Dr. Imad Nakash and his professional staff for your eye care needs. There's two locations to serve you. In Hazel Park, call 248-336-3937, 248-336-3937. In Rochester Hills, call 248-299-3937. That's 248-299-3937. Are your hands feeling numb? Do you feel pain opening up a jar, turning a key? Are you noticing that your elbow and your shoulder are becoming stiff? Or were you recently injured in your arm? Hello, I'm Dr. Albajit Katranji. And at the Katranji Hand Center, which just recently opened down the street from the Somerset Mall, we can provide you with the latest in hand, wrist, elbow, and shoulder care. Visit us at www.katranjihandcenter.com to learn the latest techniques that we have to offer you. And I look forward to taking care of you. Visit us in Troy at 1565 West Big Beaver Road, Building F. Or call Katranji Hand Center for an appointment at 248-869-4263. That's 248-869-4263. The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio, and we're also streaming live on facebook.com forward slash Arab News. And 
and welcome back to segment two of the Ray Ananias Show here in Detroit and Washington, D.C. and the U.S. Arab Radio Network. Uh, also brought streaming live on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arab News. Just a little plug for next week. We have Anissa Asabi George. She's an Arab American running in the race for mayor of Boston. Miss George is an American politician who serves as an at large member of the Boston City Council, where she's a chair of both the Committee on Education and Homelessness, Mental Health and Recovery. So we're going to talk to her about Arab American empowerment and her election in Boston. But right now, I want to return to uh, our guest, uh, one of my favorites, Dalia al uh, She's an Arab news columnist um, and uh, offers some insight that, you know, I think is, you know, right, very balanced and smart. Um, you know, especially in this world in America where everybody is divided, I, people are yelling at me, Dahlia, from both sides. You know, if you say know. something nice about Biden, they get mad. If you say something nice about Trump, uh, they get mad. Nobody's 100 percent. But um, mm -hmm. I think that when criticism is justified, it's justified right on both sides. Let's exactly. start first. Let's start with uh, uh, looking at Trump and Biden and the withdrawal. Um, it seems like the the withdrawal wasn't the problem. The problem was nobody pay, seemed to pay attention to the government of Afghanistan. They seemed to be in cape. They were in, clearly incapable of controlling the company, and they just fled. They just yeah. left everything and ran. Was there a way to prevent that? Do you think? Did Trump do enough? Did Biden do enough? Or did everybody not pay attention? When you mentioned earlier, exactly, we're on top of each other, you know, on each other's throats. It's, no, it's you, no, it's you. And every time, like for, for me, when I say, well, what happened uh, um, was a disaster um, in the history of the United States. But, oh, Trump did this. It's like, okay, argue with me. Who told you I agreed with the idea that Trump decided to uh, to negotiate with a terrorist group, which was Taliban. I mean, just because I'm a conservative or just because I'm a Republican doesn't mean that I, that's why I left Iraq 600 years ago. <laughs> like, uh, it's it's not because he's the president, I have to agree with, him, with everything he says or everything he does. And that's exactly what happened when, when uh, Trump, uh, administration decided to go into negotiation and talks with the, with the Taliban. I was against it 100% because I thought we cannot um, talk uh, or negotiate with with a terrorist group. Once a terrorist, always a terrorist, and and especially when it comes to the the uh, uh, the ideology of of the Taliban slash Al Qaeda slash ISIS slash all all this group, and that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing that um, uh, Taliban for the past twenty years never condemned Al Qaeda to start with. Right. Al Qaeda was operating in fifteen provinces in right. Afghanistan. I so always saw them as being the same. I always saw them as being the same. We have the and Haqqani group, which is part of al-Qaeda that's a right um, they are the same except Let, let's ask let's ask everybody on Facebook um that are joining us to say yes or no should we have should the United States have left Afghanistan so if you want to write yes or no I'll we'll take a just a, a anecdotal look at that but Dahlia, should we have left Afghanistan in your we opinion? Should have, we should have worked with the Afghan, uh, Afghan is a government. Um, let me tell you, when we were talking, we as, as Americans, we were talking uh, in Doha, which I have my... I know. Um, we're talking about Qatar and we're talking about Turkey. We will talk we'll talk about them but when we were talking about them we did not talk the the afghan government was a part of these negotiations right we made the the government uh weak and that's that's the problem so you and think then, we you think we undermined the afghan government definitely so we definitely. shouldn't be we shouldn't be surprised then that they collapsed when we openly said we're going to talk with the Taliban. And without um, you. 
we did that in Vietnam. We said we're going to talk to the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. And, and what do you think the South Vietnamese government said? Wow, they're going to stab us in the back. We better grab what we can and get out of here. Is That's what happened, isn't it, exactly. in Afghanistan? Exactly. And then what happened to that? We don't support any military coup around the world. What happened with the Taliban? It was exactly this one. Yes, the president left. They, there was a vice president, but the vice president did not have anybody to support him because the U.S. decided that oops, let's let's get out. Then you have Biden who said, "I inherited a bad deal." Okay, you inherited few deals. You inherited the the deal. Uh, with the JCPOA and uh, President Trump decided to get out of it. Trump decided to get out of the Paris Accord. Trump decided to build the wall. What happened in the first few days after Biden uh, uh, came to office? He went back to the negotiation for the JCPOA, which I'm against 100%. He went back to the Paris Accord. He stopped building the wall. So giving me as an American, that I inherited a bad deal doesn't cut it for me because you're the president. If you really thought it was a bad, a bad deal, then uh, it, what were you waiting for? And, and you know, we'll, we only have a few minutes. I know I hate this because uh, it's like radio is so short, right? Oh, no. <laughs> what do you what do you think he should? Well, first of all, how do you grade Biden in terms of Afghanistan? Oh my uh, God! Oh my God! I think. Biden, his administration, and his party will pay the price for what happened in Afghanistan in the midterms next year. Yeah. I truly believe that. It's, it's going to have an impact. Exactly, exactly. It's not about that. It's, about, it's like when, when Biden came to office, everybody said, oh, America's back. Look at our European allies. Look at the, war, the world, how... Uh, uh, America is back again. Well, guess what? We left. We left our allies. We left the the Brits and the French. With that, the, I mean, we just need to watch the video of the French ambassador when he was evacuated from. America. He didn't know what was happening. It's sad when we if if we just watch different news outlets other than Americans, if we, uh, the Europeans, and if we uh, watch the, or read the news in Asia, part of Asia, China now, China is, is, is getting ready and China is sending straight messages to Taiwan saying, well, you're not better than the Afghans. You know, um, Arabs, Arabs have played dominoes for years. The U.S. should have turned to us. And we could have told them that when you knock the domino chips down, the domino theory that they applied in Vietnam is going to apply here. There is a big concern that we're going to see a spread. We only have like two minutes left, Ali. <gasps> what I know, what should Biden do? What what should we be doing? Is there a way to to recover so or is it lost? Um, it's it's definitely too late. We don't have intelligence on the ground. And even if we do, I mean, um, um, not even if we do, we don't. And the problem is with, with Afghanistan and look at the neighboring countries, there are no, no friends to the U.S. except India. But you have Afghanistan, you, you have you have everybody who is not U.S. friendly, which would make it very hard for us um, uh, to, to gather intelligence on what's going on. Given the fact that every time uh, Biden speaks, you have the intelligence community getting out and you have the military getting out and, and contradict everything he says, including the, we didn't know about the Taliban that, that, that they, were, they were taking over. And, 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 and so we don't know if he knew about it, uh, if he didn't know about it, which is... A, 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 There's nothing he can do then, you're basically saying. All right. No. Dahlia, I got to cut us off. We're right at the end of the show. I got to bring oh. you back on because this topic is not going to go away. Dahlia, 
El Akidi, yes. Arab News columnist. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, everybody, next week we'll be speaking with Anissa Asabi George, the Arab American running for mayor of Boston. I'm Ray Anania. We will see you next Wednesday again, Dahlia. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure Thanks having you on the radio. All right. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye.